Light switch for me over there. Great. That was a nice effect there on the background of that song. I didn't know that was coming. That's pretty cool there. All right. You know, last week I was thinking that um, I would be done with the Idols series. And then I woke up Monday morning and I was having my quiet time with God and I was reading and praying and um, kind of came to this passage here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And I'm like, man, look at all this stuff right here that speak to, speaks to idols and uses the word idolatry. Did you have the light switch for me over there? Um, that uses the word idolatry in the passage. And it made me realize that while we had systematically gone through several different idols and stories where people um, had battled idols, we didn't really, I didn't really significantly spell out the prescription for winning and having victory over the idols. And in this passage right here, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, really culminates the perfect ending uh, to the idolatry series. So I uh, want to move on to that. And today, basically, we're going to talk about how to crush the idols. And as the graphic on the backdrop of the songs illustrated, you know, we wrote out some of our idols that we were struggling with. Today, I hope, we'll be, give you the prognosis for how to never, you'll never fully overcome idols, 
but you'll learn to get victory over them. So it's interesting that this passage right here that we're going to read ends the same way the book of 1 John ended in chapter 5, verse 14. Flee, run from idolatry. And like I said, this is going to, we're going to go back over this and talk about how do you exactly do that? How do you run from the idols, the things that want to gain control in your life, and how do you crush them so that you have victory over them? Um, basically, what we're going to cover in this passage quickly is there's six spiritual blessings that the nation of Israel have, had that we also have. There was three common idols that they all struggled with, and then he gives six practical instructions. So, first of all, um, you've probably heard me say this before, a great Russian proverb. It's not in the Bible, but maybe it should be. But anyway... I'm joking when I say that. That a good man learns from his own mistakes, a wise man learns from the mistakes of others, but a fool never learns. I, um, I was fortunate enough to be the youngest of six or seven, depends on how you count them. Um, the reason I say seven is because my mom and dad lost their first when she was two, and then, but I grew up with a family of six. I became a Christian when I was nine. I was the first in my family to become a born-again Christian. So I saw five older brothers and sisters go through, you know, pay the stupid tax for me. I saw them do things that I'm thinking, ah, I'm not the smartest guy in the world, but I think I don't want to try that because I just saw what it did to my whole family and how it messed things up. So I was able to be spared a lot of pain and trouble from learning from my brothers and sisters' mistakes. And that can be true of you. And especially if you are younger, let's say you're under 30, um, there's a lot of things your parents are telling you or have told you that you're thinking, eh, well, whatever, you know. And then you make the same dumb mistake like, oh, yeah, mom and dad were right. You know, we, whether it's the where you work or your educational track you're on or in your marriage, where it may be, there's people who have gone on before and have been painful pioneers and have suffered because of their own stupidity. There's no reason to go down that trail again. So the question is, what causes us to make the same mistakes that people have been making for thousands of years? Uh, it's called pride. <laughs> well, yeah, a hundred million people have messed up this way before, but I won't. And somehow we think that we're going to be the exception to the rule. Pride is what makes us make those same mistakes. He says in verse 1, he says, I don't want you to be unaware. Some translations say ignorant. In other words, you need to know some things, and if you will know these things and not just have knowledge but apply wisdom to them, you won't be ignorant. So he's going to teach us a few things, and the problem is many of us are unaware. We, don't, we have no clue. We go through life thinking, you know, we're just going to blindly go down this path and everything's going to turn out peachy and rosy. But what we need to do is open up our eyes and realize that there's a lot of dangers out there, and, they, and yes, there's an enemy who is trying to take you down. Okay, Satan knows what his end is, and he's trying to make as many go down with him. It's, just, it's kind of like the, the kid who gets in trouble with school. Okay, well, I have to go to the principal's office. I'm ratting out everybody else, so now I'm not the only one you know, going down. And then he says, <clears throat> see here. He says, I do not want you to be a, unaware, brothers. So who is Paul talking to? He's talking to believers. Now, if you're here this morning, you're not really sure where you stand with Jesus, and you're thinking, I, I might want to follow Christ, I might not, I'm still kind of checking this out, that's great, that's cool, you're in a good place for that. But what I'm about to talk about applies to people who are in Christ, who have made a commitment, who have been born again, and therefore know Him. There are still some principles that you can learn if you're not a follower of Christ, but just watch through, and you'll be able to bear through with this. But these promises are to you, as a believer. And a promise is only as valuable as the person making the promise. If I said to you, Heather, I'm going to give you a, a, a $10,000 bonus this week on your check, okay, I wouldn't take that to the bank, <laughs> okay? Bounce down's doing okay, but not, not, not that good, okay? Um, so my promise to you is only as good as the person making it. In this case, that person, I wouldn't really count on it. There's some people, you know, there's other people who so, say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll be there at 2 o'clock. And you're like, yeah, right, you're always late, okay? But when God makes a promise, you can take that to the bank, okay? And in this passage here, he's going to share some principles that are also some promises that will help you get rid of the idols and have victory over the idols in your life. 
So he's going to give us a history lens, lesson. And whenever you're reading through your Bible and you see words repeated, there's a reason for that, okay? Paul, what word do you see highlighted here? All. And there's three times here, and there'll be two more times. Five times, Paul, who graduated from the Redundancy School of Redundancy, is going to make a point here that all these people, no exceptions, had the same benefits, had the same experience. And so what was that experience? He said, all our fathers, the word fathers here means progenitors, ancestors, all of the ancient Israel were under the cloud. Now, those of you who know your Bible history and you, your Sunday school lessons might know, when Israel was wandering in the wilderness, and they woke up in the morning, and they want to know, they, they had a basically a portable tent city that they could pack up and move at any time. And they were moving a lot through the wilderness. They could wake up in the morning, and if they wanted to know where God was taking them next, where would they look? They could see a cloud. And it, was, it wasn't just any old cloud. It was a pillar. It was a cloud that kind of funneled down. Have, have you ever seen a funnel cloud up close? Okay, yeah. I, I, seriously, I, um, I'm not a total idiot. I'm a little bit. But I, I could seriously do storm chasing. I think that would be like the funnest thing in the world. Like get in, in one of those weather SUVs and get real close to the hurricane. I'm serious. I would just so do that. So if anybody's wanting to make a trip to Kansas, let me know. Um, Anyway, all of them were under the cloud, okay? So they had this direction to where, hey, where are we going next? The cloud started moving. Okay, let's pack up. Let's follow the cloud. And then how many of them passed through the sea? All of them, okay? Now, let's, let's picture this scene here. Pharaoh, in his frustration, finally says, fine, okay, go. After 10 plagues, which the last of which took his son, okay, he's just totally... Uh, discouraged and just says okay fine go and so Israel wanders out into the wilderness uh, following Moses they've, they're packed up with all this silver and gold and all this stuff and they're heading out and they're going between two mountains and they come to the Red Sea and now Pharaoh's people are like hey what did you just do man you let my maid go you let all our builders go you let all our farmers go all the people doing the work for us you let them go yeah what did I do Let's go. And he gathers up his army, chases them. So here they're surrounded on every side. They've got Pharaoh's army behind, a mountain on either side, and the Red Sea in front. And all of a sudden, like, oh, where are we going to go? Moses, what did you do? Why did you bring us out here? And he said, you know, behold the power of God. And he holds out his staff. And what happens to the Red Sea? It parts. And they don't walk across on mud. They walk across on what? Dry ground. And so can you imagine, and you probably, if you've seen The Prince of Egypt, the movie, that's pretty cool. And they walk along, and there's this wall of water, and there's whales going through, and all kinds of sea creatures. I mean, that, that doesn't even begin to portray what, how cool that must have been. And every single one of these Israelites walked through, and when they got to the other side, when the last person stepped on shore, the waters came crashing down in Egypt. And you know, this isn't just a fairy tale. They have found Egyptian chariot wheels at the bottom of the Red Sea archaeologists have found this stuff this is not just fair this is history this things have ap actually happened so they all experience this miraculous deliverance now think about that if you had actually gone through that saw that sea part you got the egyptian army coming after you oh we're gonna die and then you come out and pfft, and then it just collapse you'd be like oh my gosh there is a god and you'd be, you'd be like the first omg right there okay <laughs> do you think you would ever turn your back on god ever Yes, you would. <laughs> yes, you would. And Israel did time and time again. And because you know what? Almost everybody in this room, if not everybody, you have experienced something miraculous where God changed your life. And yet, last week, you did something really stupid that turned your back on God. Okay. If it wasn't last week, it was, it's been recently enough. Okay. Because that's human nature. We just forget. We don't remember history very well. Verse 2 says, and all were baptized into Moses. Don't let this word baptized confuse you. The baptism simply, word, the word means immersion or to be placed under, okay? When you were physically baptized, whether it was in a cattle trough or a baptistry in a church or a river, you were placed under the water. So the word here simply means they were placed under Moses' authority, okay? God said, here's your leader, follow him. I'm placing you under his authority, <coughs> pardon me 
And so they were baptized or placed in union or under the authority of Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So God showed what he was doing in this situation and gave them a spiritual leader. So you look at all these things God has done in this verse. And then look at the next one. The word all appears two more times. And all ate the same spiritual food. They're like, Moses, we're hungry. What are we going to eat? And God sent this heavenly bread from heaven. Called, that's redundant. Um, and they woke up in the morning and there was, what was it called? Manna, right? And I don't, we don't know exactly what manna was. We know it tasted like coriander seed, which I don't know what that is either. Amanda, you know? I don't know. Uh, AIDS and digestion. Okay, good. So we have a resident expert here. So, um, so, and it was like almost like it was flavored with honey. Man, that sounds, that sounds like the best sopapilla ever made, okay? I mean, it just, and so this is what they're eating. This, this he, the original angel food cake right there from, from heaven. They woke up in the morning. And the nice thing about that was you could gather as much as you wanted for the day, but could you stockpile it? No, what would happen if you stockpiled it? Yeah, it would break out in canker worms and all that stuff. But God showing, proving that it was a miracle. On Friday, though, you could double up and, and get as much as you needed for two days because on the Sabbath day, gathering food would have been considered work. And that, that, didn't, that didn't rot or, or get worms in it. And what was also interesting was there was a few pieces of it that were put in the Ark of the Covenant that didn't rot either or get worms in it. So they ate this miraculous spiritual food and they all drank the same spiritual drink. So here they're out in the wilderness in a desert climate and they're thirsty and God and Moses you know, prays to God and we need water to drink and God says, smite the rock. So he takes this, and we're not talking about a rock like this, we're talking about word rock as in rock of Gibraltar. We're talking about something really big and significant. So whether it was at the base of a mountain, we really don't know. But Moses takes his rod and he smites the rock and it cracks open and water gushes forth and flows for, for and it must have been the best tasting water. Now what's, what's interesting about that story is later Moses gets frustrated with people and what does he do? He smites the rock again and because of that Moses was not allowed into the promised land. You think, gosh, that seems really harsh. Why was that? Because it tells us that that rock was who? Yeah, read the bottom of the verse. The rock was Christ, okay? And Christ was smitten w once for sins, not twice, okay? And so he was basically committing blasphemy, if you will, and it was also symbolic in the sense that Christ is the living water because he was smitten and broken for us. We have life eternal, which is that spiritual drink. So there's a lot of symbolism here. And so they drank from that spiritual rock. And this is really interesting. That rock followed them. I don't know how to explain this. I don't know if it made a lot of noise, you know, through the desert, whatever. All I know is that whether they woke up, wait, wait, it's still there. Then they went four more miles, set up a tent, woke up, it's there. I don't know how it happened, but the Bible says it happened, so I, I'll go with it. And that rock was Christ, which again, we'll talk more about that symbolism there. So watch what all of them had. They all had spiritual direction. Where are we going to go? The cloud tells you. They all had spiritual deliverance. They were about to be killed. God miraculously pulls them through the sea. <clears throat> they were given a spiritual leader in Moses, who, by the way, is called the most humble man that ever lived. So, you know, he would not have been a, gr been a great politician. Obviously, he had to be handpicked by God. Um, spiritual drink. So they were given this water supernaturally spiritual food manna and the spiritual presence the rock who was jesus that followed them everywhere they went so they all had these six benefits how many people had it oh now again put yourself in the story any one of these you would think would be life altering like wow but experience all of these i mean every one of these supernatural moses all the miracles he just did the 10 plagues he just took on um, Pharaoh in a cage fight and won, you know, and he just went down and did all these miracles, the water flowing, you're waking up, you're tasting this manna, you're experiencing this rock that's kind of following you and everything, and you think, man, you would think these would be the most godly people in the world. 
If we believe, as the humanist teaches, that man is a product of his environment, these should be perfect people, right? But that's not what happens. Look what happens in the next verse here. It says, that Nevertheless, after all these things, he's, Paul is going to do some hyperbole here, which for those of you who graduate from Dickinson High School, it means he's going to exaggerate here. Okay? Nevertheless, with most of them, God was not pleased. Most? Go back and read the story in Numbers. Everybody 20 and older didn't go into the promised land, except for two. Who was the two? Joshua and Caleb. So we're talking tens of thousands of people and not counting the kids, only two of them. So I think it's pretty close to say 99.98% of the people God was not well pleased with. Showing that don't blame your bad habits, your idols, your straying away from God on your environment. Oh, it's just been a rough year and I lost my job and whatever. I know I haven't been doing act like the best husband or I haven't been this been a good parent or whatever. Do not start the list of excuses. Here's people who have a perfect environment and they still fail God because the problem is not what's around us but what's within us. It's a matter of the heart. Like Martin Luther said, the heart is an idle factory. We produce these problems on our own. And it says that they were overthrown in the wilderness. The word overthrown, uh, some translations say overtaken. It's like someone running a race and someone runs up behind them and passes them. Okay? Or worse yet, runs up behind them and tackles them and takes them down. Um, and it says that these things were, now these things took place as examples for who? For you. So this week I want you to read this passage, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, because God took the time to write down these thousands of years old examples so that you wouldn't have to be to pay the stupid tax again. Remember, a, wise, a good man learns from his own mistakes. A wise man learns from the mistakes of others right here. But a fool never learns. So which one will you be this morning? Here you have an opportunity to not repeat what they did. It says these are written, for example, for us, that we might not desire evil. It's all a matter of the heart. It's not that the evil is around you trying to get into your heart. It's that there's evil in our hearts, and we desire that to fulfill it as they did. So we have, all of us have the same things in common. Where they were given the spiritual direction of the cloud, we have the Holy Spirit of God. We are supposed to be not only filled with the Spirit, we're supposed to be led by the Spirit. That's a promise we have from God. Uh, we also experience spiritual deliverance. If you've been saved, you've been saved from something worse than bondage in Egypt. Okay, You've been saved from bondage to sin. And so we have that deliverance. And that's not just a, uh, a one-time deliverance that happens in the past. Being born again is. But you're delivered from sin's power on a regular basis. Remember, there's three it's types of salvation in the Bible. There's sin's pa penalty. The wages of sin is what? Death, okay? When you were born again, you accepted Christ as your Savior, you were saved from sin's penalty. But, but we still struggle with sin. There's salvation from sin's power, okay? Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Paul said in Romans chapter 7. He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ. So you can get victory over sin from sin's power, and then someday we will be taken from sin's presence, that we will be saved from the wrath that is to come, that the world will go through the tribulation, we will not, we'll be delivered out of that. So read uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, if you're taking notes. You can talk about the three different types of salvation right there. So we experience supernatural deliverance on a regular basis. We also are given spiritual leadership. Jesus is our ultimate spiritual shepherd. He's the second Moses, but you're given pastors in the body and other people who shepherd one another. And so that's, that's why you, everyone needs someone who is mentoring them as well as mentoring someone below you in age or maturity. So we're given spiritual leadership. <coughs> Excuse me. We're given a spiritual drink. Jesus said to the woman at the well, you know, if you partake of me, you'll never thirst again. That relationship that you have with Jesus ought to be satisfying to your soul. There's also spiritual food, the equivalent to manna, is our Bible. Give us this day our daily bread, right? That's not just talking about physical bread. That's talking about eating. And think about this. 
reading four chapters on Monday doesn't feed you through the rest of the week. Okay? Just like the manna, you got to gather it every day and twice on Sunday. Okay? You got to gather it. You got to be in the Word. You can't just stockpile it and say, okay, I read, I read the whole Gospel of John on Saturday. I'm good for a month. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. You need to be communing with Jesus. We're not just going through you version to check it off and say, okay, I got that done. Boom, put that away. It's, hey, good morning, Jesus. Let's have a conversation. I'm going to pray to you. You're going to speak to me through your word and that my soul will be satisfied with this manna from heaven. And then we have the spiritual ch- ch- presence. Jesus asked the disciples, who do men say that I am? And Peter, one of the few times he actually said something right, he said, you are the Christ the son of the living God. He said, bingo, Peter. Bingo's in the Greek right there. Check it out. Anyway, he said, way to go, Peter. He said, upon this rock, not you, the rock, Peter. He said, you, you are Petros. Upon this Petra, I will build my church. Upon the statement that I am the Christ, son of the living God. So he, I will build my church. So the church is upon a rock. So the rock that followed them in the wilderness is the church that you're a part of. You're a part of Revolution Church or any Bible-believing church that you're a part of, that's your spiritual presence. That's how you experience the body of Christ. So we have all these benefits. And so he says, therefore, don't you be idolaters, as some of them were. And again, hyperbole, as some of them were. (laughs) I think all of them, but two. He said, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Okay? It's party, get drunk, pass out, vomit, repeat. That was basically the lifestyle that they had fallen into while Moses is up in the mountain. And you know the whole story there, how Aaron um, is like panicking, the people are panicking, where's Moses, where's Moses? And they're all freaking out because they're so codependent on Moses that they can't approach God themselves. And so like, hey, make us a calf. And so he makes them a calf. And they have this wild, drunken orgy. And it was just a horrible situation. And the word play here means, you know, Bad stuff, okay? And so, um, and, if, and if you think I'm reading too much into that, just read the next verse. It says, we must not indulge in sexual morality as some of them did. It was so wicked and so vile that God struck 23,000 of them dead. That's how bad and how horrific it, and immoral that it was. So, what you have is Israel who came out of an idolatrous land of Egypt. God delivered them, saved them out of that. Corinthians were a very, lived in a very idolatrous culture. Aphrodite was a sex god that was worshipped, and so sex acts were committed in the temples as a way of worship. It was very, very pagan. And a lot of these Corinthians are getting saved out of that culture. And Paul's saying, don't go back to it. Israel went through that. <clears throat> You've been through that. You've been saved out of that. But it also not only applies to Israel, it doesn't just apply to Corinth, it applies to Revolution Church today. And so he's going to go through the common sins or idols that they struggle with. Number one, he said, we must not put Christ to the test as some of them did and were destroyed of serpents. The common problem amongst believers is we will ask the wrong questions. I, as a pastor, I get asked questions all the time. Can I still sleep with my girlfriend and go to heaven? Can I not tithe and still be considered a faithful Christian? Um, What kind of movies can you watch and what kind of movies can you not? And all these questions are basically asking, how far can I go to the very edge and not fall off? And you're asking the wrong question. It should be, how much can I give to God? How much more than 10% can I give? How, how, how pure can my thoughts be? How much time can I give to others volunteering and serving God? How much can I give to the homeless? How much can I do? And we, we're asking the wrong questions. Instead of seeing how far can you push God to the limits like Israel did and still be God's children, okay? <clears throat> what happened, the big complaint against those of us, including me, who believe in eternal security, that once saved, always saved, the knock against us is, oh, that means you can do whatever you want. Yeah, but the consequence is, is not that God will disown me, but that God will discipline me, okay? Um, Isaiah could go out and do whatever he wanted right now. I mean, he could grow up and start to sell drugs and uh, get involved in organized crime and do all kinds of stuff. Would he still be my son? 
Yes, he would. I wouldn't disown him. I would discipline him. Okay? And so that's what you see with the prodigal son. He came home after doing all that he did. And the prodigal son is really not about the one that left. It's about the one who stayed home, who could not get over. Wait a minute. Fatted calf, ring, robe? I didn't get any of that stuff, and I've been here obeying the whole time. That is not right that he got, out, go, got to go out and do whatever he wanted to do, and he still gets to come home? That's grace. That's grace. And see, really, we're, we're all getting far more than we deserve. So it's not, so anyway, I don't want to get off on that too far, but God doesn't like when people put him to the test, and so he sent what, was the, the, what, the, what the Old Testament calls fiery serpents. And to, even today over in the Middle East, Middle, Middle East, there, there is a type of fire. There's two types of serpents that they think it was one of the two. One of them, that the, the serpent's skin looks like fire. It has that, you know, yellow, red, like kind of almost looks like a flame on the side of the snake. The other one doesn't look fiery, but feels fiery. When it bites you, you think your leg is on fire, okay? And what the ironic thing about the second one, which I believe it's the second one, is you feel like your leg is on fire, and then after about 45 minutes, the pain goes away, and you get up and you're like, oh, wow, okay, I survived that. I guess I'm okay. And then you go home, and you go to bed that night, and you wake up dead in the morning. You wake up dead. Did you catch that? Okay. Because the poison has now traveled to your liver, and within 24 hours, you're dead. But you thought you were fine. And so people were dropping dead left and right. And they were thinking, no, no, I'm fine. And Moses said, no, went to God and pleaded to God on, to forgive the people for being evil and tempting him. And he said, okay, what I want you to do is fashion a copper serpent and lift it up on a pole. I mean, this is like some serious tall pole so that everybody in the camp, if, they, if anywhere they're at, they get bitten, they could look to the pole. And of course, the, the snake, think about a pole, the snake is wrapped around the pole the only thing that keeps the, sna- the pole from sliding down, the, the snake from sliding the pole, is he put a cross beam on it, and therefore when it wraps around, it rests on that. And so it was a picture of the cross. And that's what Jesus said in John chapter 3, just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So there's a great picture of Jesus Christ on the cross that anybody who looks to him will be healed. So what would happen is people would get bitten by a snake but, and they'd suffer through it all, and they'd get up like, oh, okay, I'm fine. And, hey, you need to look to the cross and be healed. Like, no, no, I'm fine. I've got this. And the next day, they'd be dead. And some people think, and there's a dispute over this, this is where the bronze serpent around the medical symbol came from. Is that what you're t- Yeah, Jennifer, I know Jennifer, that's what she was saying. I read your lips from here. So be careful what you say. Okay. Not it. Anyway, um, but yeah, some people think this is where the medical symbol, like Blue Cross Blue Shield, comes from where the, the, the serpent on the cross. Okay, so anyway, <clears throat> next verse, next part of the verse here. So verse 10 says, uh, do not grumble. Let's see here, hold on. Give me just a second. All right, it says, do not grumble, nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Okay, so, some translations say murmur, which, as you've heard me say before, this is an onomatopoeic word. It means what it sounds like. When people are over there and they don't like the way things are happening, well, she said this, blah, 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 but I didn't know they said they were going to do this, blah, blah, blah. Mur, 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 mur. That's what it sounds like. God hates this kind of stuff. And you think that, wow, these are some serious sins, and he puts in the list of them complaining. Well, God does hate complaining. He thinks because basically, when you complain against the circumstances around you, you're complaining against the God who's in control of the circumstances. And they complained about Moses. They complained about the manna. They complained about the lack of water. They complained about not being in Egypt anymore. And it's funny how people lose sight of the past and don't learn lessons from that. So there are three common idols here. were sexual immorality, testing God's grace, pushing him to the limits, and complaining and grumbling against God. And these are the three things that we struggle with. Isn't this not true? We live in a sex-obsessed culture to where it's made to be if you're married and faithful to one woman or one man, that's boring. But if you're over here with strangers and doing all kinds of crazy stuff on Friday nights, that's exciting. And that's totally opposite 
of what reality is. Vanity Fair magazine, which I don't recommend, but about 15 years ago did a survey of women who were most satisfied in their relationships. And it was monogamous married women, and it was particularly religious women. So it, it, it's true what the Bible says, and in spite of what Satan and the world wants to tell you, and testing Christ, don't live on the edge. Don't always sit there and say, how much can I get away with and still be a Christian? How much can I get away with and still stay married? How much can I w- get away with and still be a half-decent parent? Be the kind of person that is in the center of God's will, and then finally, not grumbling against God. Accepting your circumstances, realizing God makes the circumstances to make you stronger. We were talking about this morning in the 9 o'clock class about what a, a, a caterpillar has to go through to become a butterfly. And that that breaking out of the cocoon is not comfortable, it's, but that stretching and working its way out is what makes it into the butterfly and that, that, that stress it has to go through. What is God putting you through? Think about what has stressed you out the most this past week. Do you want out from under it, or do you want to find out what God is trying to do to make you stronger in that situation? So it says that these things happen to them as an example. And it's good to know in in our Christian life, we've got good examples and we've got bad examples. Think of somebody that you look up to that you want to be like. It's not a problem. I mean, yes, we're supposed to ultimately follow Jesus, but Paul said, be you followers of me as I follow Christ. So think of someone you know that is following Christ. It's good to learn to be like them. Think about someone you know who is the Antichrist. I mean, not literally, but they're, they're not a good example. Okay? In what ways are you becoming opposite of them? And God has put both into your life to teach you a lesson. And it says, but they, these things were written down. Where were these things written down? in your Bible. And we wonder why we stray into certain idolatrous sins and we don't see a connection between not being in the Word. Okay? The more time you spend in the Word, not just reading it just to move the check mark, but you're really communicating with God, the more you have an immune system spiritually built up to fight off these idolatrous temptations. They are written down for our instructions. So We can't get upset at God if we're not reading an instruction manual. It says, on whom the end of the ages have come. Um, It's interesting. If you look at history, there's basically a week of history, seven days. Okay? And so when Jesus talked about, many times when the Bible talks about the last days, it's not talking about literal 24-hour days. It's talking about ages. And so we're in the Messianic age, the last 2,000 years of, of basically of history and then the kingdom to come. So we're in that, that age where the Messiah has come, and we have the written scriptures to help us through these problems. It says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks he stand take heed. Take heed. We don't use the word heed a lot, but it means to, to, to receive instruction, to, to receive wisdom, to sit down and do a personal evaluation of what are my weaknesses and how can I avoid them unless I be the same person that falls. You know, this is one of the most misquoted scriptures that I hear people say all the time. Not verse 17. I'll read verse 17, but verse 18. The highway of the upright turns aside from evil. Okay? The road you're traveling down, if you're going to be an upright person, when you see evil, you need to take a detour, turn aside. Whoever guards his way or protects his path he's on preserves his life. Pride goes before yeah, that's the most misquoted verse of the Bible. It's not what the verse says. It says pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. But people quote that all the time. Pride goes before a fall. They, but, and it's ultimately basically the same thing. But pride, when you think, oh yeah, I got this. Oh yeah, I got this. We're okay. Um, I can handle this. That's like those notorious last words before it breaks, you know. Um, we've all been in situations where we thought, we knew what we were doing, and it came back to bite us. It's like the proverb that says, a guy rolls a rock up a hill, and it rolls back on him. When you think, I would never do that. You know, you hear of someone's moral failure, or falling off the wagon, or losing their job, and you somehow, in the back of your mind, consciously or subconsciously, or verbally, or just in your thoughts, you think, oh, 
that would never be me. That's when you need to be careful. That's when you need to be careful. Because you think you've arrived and you haven't. And what pride does, it, it takes away that barrier that protects us, which is the Holy Spirit. So how do you take heed? Let's make this practical. Number one, you look in the mirror. As you read the scriptures, you've got to see where are these flaws pointing out, okay? I'm sure almost everybody in this room looked in the mirror before you left the house. And you're like, oh, there's a hair sticking up, or my makeup's crooked for you. Um, or, oh, oh, wow. You know, um, I remember one time I was, I had done a Sunday morning here at Bouncetown, and then we opened, I uh, did the church, you know, and then, um, then we opened up Bouncetown, and a friend of mine who goes to another church came up to me and said, hey, well, how was your Sunday? I'm good, and how was yours? It was really cool, and he said, I could pray for you about, and I said, yeah, I, and I told him what was going on, and he said, let's pray right now. Just standing right over there by that trash can in the middle of Bouncetown, this guy puts his hand on my shoulders and starts praying for me. And then I'm like, man, thank you, brother. I appreciate it. And he gave me a hug. And then he whispered in me. And he goes, by the way, your fly is down. I go on all Sunday morning, all Sunday morning with my zipper down, evidently, or something like that. But I, I guess that's one of the things you don't see when you look in the mirror. But when you look in the mirror of God's word, you see everything head to toe. You see all your flaws, all your failures. And what we need to do is spend time in the word, not just looking at the face of Jesus, but looking at what Jesus tells us and convicts us where we have fallen short. Number two, we need to pray for inspection. David prayed, search me and know me and see if there be any wicked way in me. We need to be praying on a daily basis, if not moment by moment basis. God revealed to me the things that I'm not seeing. Give, giving the Holy Spirit of God permission to inspect our lives. And then number three, we need to be sharpened by iron. We need other people to come along and say, hey, this is where you need to improve. This, you need to talk to your wife more respectfully. You need to be more in the word. Or at this time in your life, you should be knowing some of these things better. Someone who can speak the, the, the bold truth to us, but speak the truth in love and let us know where we're, that we need to be accountable to one another. Because it says in verse 13 that there's no temptation overtaking you. Same word as used previously. Someone run a race and someone catches up and overtakes them. <clears throat> and there's no, no temptation or nothing that's happened to you that is not common to man. Let me actually go backward here. It says, but God is faithful and he will not let you to be tempted above your ability. So this relates really well to Hebrews. Hebrews talks about running a race. Charles has run marathons before. You're my hero, man. I don't know if I'll ever do that. My, one of my goals is this fall to run a sprint triathlon. We'll see. Hold me accountable to that. But anyway, um, this is talking about basically a marathon runner that if you're going to run a race, you need lightweight shoes, lightweight clothing. So you've got to lay aside all those weights and sin. It's interesting. It makes a distinction between weights and sins. Okay? Weights are things that are good but not necessary. And there may be things in your life that's slowing you down in living for God that aren't necessarily bad, but maybe they're hobbies or extracurriculars that just uh, don't have to be there. And then there's definitely sins that weigh us down that need to go away. And they cling so closely. Let us run with endurance the races set before us. And so that's what, that's what Paul's kind of referring to back here in Corinthians. He says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man, and yet we'll hear people all the time, well, you just understand my situation. As if it's unique, like you're the only person in history that ever went through what you're going through. You're not going through anything that anybody else hasn't experienced. Maybe the names and the locations have changed, but it's basically the same root idol that you're dealing with that other people have dealt with. The, the, praise God for the next phrase there. God is faithful. God doesn't just leave you abandoned to deal and struggle with this forever. He's faithful to you, and he will not, everybody say will not. He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. Which, that's really interesting because if you're really going through the ringer, God must think your ability is pretty high. Okay? And other people don't seem like they're going through much. It's probably because God doesn't think they can handle much. And if you're wondering why you're always struggling financially, it's because maybe God doesn't think you're able to handle more money because you'd be tempted above your ability. And you can apply that to things far beyond money. 
but will with the temptation. See, this temptation comes, every time a temptation comes, there's also provided what? A way of escape. So this thing, I, I couldn't help myself. I just, I, I had no choice. Th those are just rationalizations. There is a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. And he says, therefore, because of all these things he just said, my beloved, you should flee or run from idolatry. So let me give you six practical instructions here, and then we'll do question and answer. All right, so number one, study the examples. Some people say, well, is, is the Old Testament still relevant today? Don't we just need to read the New Testament? Not according to Paul. Paul just gave you a very exhaustive Old Testament history lesson right there, saying these things were written in the Old Testament for your examples. You're doing really good to read them. Number two, stay humble. Every time you think you've grown spiritually, don't pat yourself on the back and realize, you know what, I could fall that quickly except for the grace of God. Number three, stop thinking it's just you. <laughs> when you have this idea that nobody understands, nobody's going through what I've gone through, everybody's judging me, you're going through something that other people have gone through as well. Don't have a self-interested pity party there. Um, let's see, where did I go here? See, when you, when you think it's just you, you do three deadly sins. Number one, you rationalize rather than repent. I'm failing because this is unique. Nobody else is, other people aren't failing. I'm sorry. Um, I got a new iWatch here. So now I could, I could re decline my first call on it. There we go. You rationalize rather than repent. You start making excuses rather than saying, you know what, God, you're right. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have gone through this. And number two, you isolate rather than integrate. You get alone by yourself because nobody understands when really what you need to do is join yourself to a life group or a small group or people in a Bible study who can understand and say, you know what, I've gone through something very similar to that, and you integrate instead of isolate. And number three, you end up concealing your sin rather than confessing your sin. So don't think it's just you. Don't go down that path right there. So number four, see God's faithfulness. Sit down and think, now wait a minute. I, this is not the first crisis I've been through. A couple weeks ago, you could say, it's not my first rodeo, right? And you could sit there and say, you know what? I've been this before. How did God get me out of it before? And did God prove himself faithful before? And before that, before that. Recount God's faithfulness. Number five, look for the exit, okay? Don't lean on your understanding and automatically swipe the credit card or tell them off or get revenge Look for, wait a minute, what is the best way of handling the situation and what's God's way of handling the situation? And then number six, run from it. Run from the idolatry. I'm not talking about running from your problems. I'm talking about running from the, the idolatry in the situation. In all this, what the, what the children of Israel went through, some of them were worshiping idols because of power, some because of control, a lot of them because of pleasure, some because of approval. And you know the, you know the routine. You've been there, done that with your own idols. And so we learn best of all from Christ's example who sacrificed himself and gave up his life for others. So, and that's what fleeing from idolatry means, that you don't please yourself anymore, but you please others. All right, who has a question for me? Let's see here. All right, here we go. Even though we know God doesn't give up, uh, give us more, I'm sorry, even though we know that God doesn't give us more than we can handle, what if you just can't hang on anymore? What if you can't bear the thought of one more day? Um, the words that come to mind right now is what Jesus said, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. God doesn't ask you for one more day. He asks you for today. All you do is you make it through. Give us this day our daily bread. God asks you to just do the same thing that AA does is just you make it through today. You don't think about tomorrow. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Tomorrow has enough cares of its own, to paraphrase what Jesus said. So I think a lot of times the reason we don't think we can make it is because we're thinking about, yeah, but what about next week? What about next year? How about three months from now? And God's saying, I'm in control of that. We don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future, right? To, to quote a song. So if you just think, what's going to make it till bedtime? I remember when I was going through my darkest time in my life, and really, the highlight of my day was putting my head on the pillow and going to sleep. 
That's all I want to do is just get through the day and make it to bedtime. I, and I would tell myself every morning, if I could just make it through the day, I'll get to go to bed tonight and not have to think about this. And you know what? That, that sounds pitiful, but that's what helped me make it through and th- in addition to the scriptures. But all I knew is I had to make it through that day. And so be faithful in the day, you know. Make it through that day in a Christ-like way. All right, let me look at another qu- question here. I've heard God will never give you more than you can handle a lot, uh, a lot, so much that others bring it up uh, to negate it. Well, I can't handle this, implying God doesn't do what he promises. How do you address this? Um, I, I would just go back to like the Psalms. David, over and over again, basically says that. <laughs> God, have you forgotten me? I think somebody wrote a song, something about that. I don't know, recently, something like that. Um, and where are you, God, through all this? And you read through these Psalms, most of them, except for Psalm 88, come to the conclusion that, you know, I'm just venting God, but I know you're loving, I know you're faithful, your mercies endure forever, and they usually come around. So here's the great thing. God doesn't despise your honesty. He's cool with you saying, God, I can't handle this, I've had enough. I don't think I can take any more. But then, yeah, I remember you did get me through this last year, something like this. In fact, it's something worse than this. And you just start recounting God's goodness and God's faithfulness and work your way through. All right, let's stand and sing, and then we'll be dismissed. How are you, man? Awkward high five. The awkward high five handshake all over. Oh God.